Rosie. I'm Ethan Allen. I'm your host of Like for Likeable Science. We're broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza. And as always, Likeable Science is, just as the name suggests, uh, here to promote the idea that science is something that should be enjoyed and is an enriching and vital part of everyone's life. It should not be feared and despised as it is by some, but should be embraced by, by all as a, as a really important but also fun part of your life. To help me explore a big topic these days, climate change, uh, I have in the studio today Dr. Art Sussman. Welcome, Art. Hi, Ethan. Uh, Art is a senior project director at WestEd and is the co-principal investigator of something called the Pacific Islands Climate Education Partnership. Right. And usually I go and introduce my, my guests and give a little bit of background, but Art sort of said he, he would rather do it himself. So right. uh, tell us a little bit about who okay. you are, Art. Uh, yeah, so I'm a scientist. Uh, and. Uh, Kind of uh, like many scientists, but not all, I kind of knew pretty early on in life that I was really interested in science and uh, followed that path. <clears throat> and then uh, by the time I'd gotten to kind of the high point of that path, you know, getting a PhD, I realized that uh, maybe I didn't want to be a research scientist. Uh, it turns out to do research science, you have to focus on some minute aspect of the universe and really just spend all your waking hours focused on that and how you're going to get grant money and publish or perish and all of that stuff. And the uh, Vietnam War was going on and Richard Nixon was president of our country. And uh, my wife, and, who was also in science, and I decided that we wanted to have a different life. And this was uh, early 1970s, um, late 60s. Uh, so we actually moved to uh, rural uh, Northern California in the Redwoods and decided to see if we could live sustainably and uh, get out of this, the rat races of all sorts. And we did that, uh, try to raise as much of our own food, uh, make our own hot water, um, did all sorts of things related to that. And it turned out that uh, I needed my science to do that, to figure out how we were going to get energy or friends were making electricity from uh, we lived in it where there's a lot of running water, so we were making electricity from that, uh, using the heat of our wood stoves to make hot water. Uh, and then uh, volunteering with uh, my daughter going through the local school, um, getting involved with science education in schools, and that's where I uh, kind of changed my career from being about being a scientific researcher to being somebody who knew a lot of, knows a lot about science and lots of different fields and the big ideas in science rather than the minutia of one particular uh, feature of the world and uh, moved my career into science education and environmental education. Okay. So uh, in that process, uh, we eventually moved back to the city uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I got in, uh, involved in working in science education uh, not as a teacher, but more as a teacher of teachers, and then eventually a teacher of the people who teach teachers, uh, sometimes fortunate enough to be back in schools, um, and figuring out how we can help school systems uh, do a much better job of teaching about science. Right, and this is to some extent what the PCEP, the Pacific Climate yeah, Pacific Island Climate yeah. Education yeah. Partnership, yeah. Is, is all about. Right? Yeah, so we have. Uh, uh, I have, over the years, been doing work. Uh, uh, I live in California, and that's where uh, the, I work for uh, an education nonprofit called WestEd, and we're headquartered uh, in San Francisco, though we are national in scope. And at WestEd is uh, kind of where we, I got uh, to build upon work I, that I had been starting to do in schools and uh, maybe like in San Francisco, but then extend it now to working at the state level and also at country level about what we do to make science education really meaningful to students, relevant to their lives, and exciting to them and growthful. Uh, and then uh, we finally had the opportunity to uh, extend that to climate education. And so we uh, partnered with a local nonprofit here in Honolulu uh, called Pacific Resources for Education and Learning, PREL, and got a grant from the National Science Foundation to work on 
helping uh, what's called the U.S. Affiliated Pacific Islands, which is Hawaii, and then uh, the three territories, uh, Guam, uh, the Marianas, and uh, American Samoa, and three freely associated states, the Federated State of Micronesia, Republic of Palau, and the Marsh Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, to help them figure out uh, what are the best ways to do education around climate change, because uh, islands uh, are among the most affected by climate change, surrounded by the seas and rising sea level. All right, All right. So. exactly. Well, that's, that's, that's great. And so you, in the process of doing this, obviously have learned a lot about uh, climate. And I think we have a, uh, well, let, 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 me, let me sort of jump into this in a different way. You've told me in the past that, that climate change is both very simple and very complicated. Right. And, and can you yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Right. Um, so uh, the science of climate change uh, is something that we've actually known about for a long time, and uh, especially uh, how carbon dioxide is involved. And carbon dioxide is a gas that's in the air. It's, to, uh, it's we call it a trace gas. There isn't that much of it in the air. It's like 0.004%, or it's, we call it 400 parts per million. Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, very influential in Earth's global climate. So that, that's one interesting thing to know about, uh, that there are gases in the air besides oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, we need to have oxygen and nitrogen in the air. We're especially fond of oxygen. <laughs> uh, but we uh, need ox nitrogen. If it was all oxygen, there would be fires around us all right. the time. Right. Everything would spontaneously combust. Absolutely. So it's a good thing that oxygen is only at 20% or so. Uh, and then there's these other gases, water vapor, um, which we're all familiar with. Uh, and then uh, carbon dioxide is one that's uh, vital for life. Uh, plants use it to make sugar, and we all depend on plants doing that. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into it in a while, but basically the idea is that carbon dioxide is part of what we call the carbon cycle, how carbon is on our planet. And uh, if you think about our planet, uh, you realize that uh, basically the stuff that's here stays here. Mm -hmm. So all the carbon that's on our planet just keeps going round and round in our planet, and it changes who it's combined with, and carbon dioxide is one of those places. Um, and uh, so that's a big idea, and it's a, it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, matter on Earth stays here and goes through various changes as it's here. Uh, kids learn in kindergarten or second grade about the water cycle, mm -hmm. how water keeps going round and round on our planet. Right. So uh, all matter, basically. All matter cycles. Sort of, yeah. yeah right. we say on our planet. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's a pretty simple idea. And then another relatively simple idea is how energy, that's how matter works on our planet, right. is how energy works on our planet. Basically, mm -hmm. In science, we are often looking at the stuff and the changes that happen to that stuff and what powers those changes. Like and on, right. on a planet Earth, we're a solar planet. Right. The sun is the most important source of energy for our planet. Uh, and here on the islands, we're you know, uh, all very aware of the energy below us with the volcanoes and earthquakes. Right. Uh, it's actually very, very small. Uh, compared to the amount of energy that we get from the sun uh, in terms of affecting uh, our weather or anything like that. So uh, from our planet's point of view, we get energy coming in from the sun, that energy moves around on our planet, and then it leaves. So it's a, we, I, we call that an open system. Uh, we always have energy coming in and going out. And our climate results from the way that energy comes in, the moves around and goes out, and how the stuff here, including life, interacts with that energy while it's here. Mm -hmm. So th that, again, is not a very hard idea. Basically, um, so understanding our climate involves understanding that the stuff keeps moving around and the energy comes in, interacts with everything here, and then leaves. And uh, the third little piece is something we've known for 100 years or more, carbon dioxide 
uh, is involved in keeping the heat longer in our planet. We call that, that it's a, a greenhouse gas. We actually think it's easier to understand by saying it's a heat trapping gas that's in our atmosphere. So the energy comes in from the sun, it warms stuff up, and that energy has to leave. And um, it leaves in the form of infrared radiation. Um, so if you've ever sat outdoors and you had a heater blasting at you, uh, that's infrared radiation. And uh, so our Earth gets heated up by the sun, and then it, uh, that heat energy leaves by infrared radiation. And there's uh, a few gases in our atmosphere that absorb that infrared radiation and keep it in the system longer. And that's actually a great thing, because if that weren't true, Earth would be frozen, and life would not be here the way it is. We wouldn't be here. So we like that. Uh, we call it the greenhouse effect, um, but it's, uh, and it's a good thing. And right, it's a very delicate balance. It's a delicate is. balance. Uh -huh. And we are now uh, twisting the knob <laughs> and having too much of a good thing. Um, we are now uh, making the heat stay longer than it has been for thousands of years. And so we're pushing ourselves towards having a warmer climate. That's the prediction. And guess what? We see it. Right. So it's not like uh, uh, some very abstract, <coughs> very difficult to understand science. So that's where I say it's easy to understand. Uh, we're changing the way energy flows through our planet. And we're right. making it stay longer. Right. And indeed, I mean, we know this. We see this in a variety of different kinds of records, of historical records of temperature. Right. Uh, you can look at, at each of the last several decades has been warmer. Right. Since it'll be in the average from the previous decade. Right. And yes, it gets hotter. There are cold spells still. But right. And I'll be showing a, a graph later on in the program where we actually <coughs> see the temperature record. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, then Earth is very complicated. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated system. So there's this simple story. Right. And then when you start going deeper into the details, right. it can get really complicated and people can get confused. So I think it's important to always come back to the simple story um, and what we're learning from, this, from that and uh, what we think we need to do about that. Uh, and then for the climate scientists who are trying to figure out even more, you know, what are we likely to be seeing, they need to be looking at those details. And I think it would be helpful for some of those uh, to be understood by people, uh, but not to the extent that uh, we lose sight of the basic story. Exactly, and that's, that's uh, very nicely put. So we have these simple, few simple ideas that really help us understand the Earth. Uh, when we come back, we're going to dig a little more deeply into this, and we're going to get involved with a, with a very nice uh, computer interactive that, that Art has, and that really helps, helps you sort of see what, what, uh, what's going on here with all the, the fluxes of energy and the matter of cycling. But that's going to be in another moment or two. Right now, we're going to have to take a, a little bit of a break. I'm Ethan Allen. You're watching Likeable Science. Dr. Art Sussman is here with me, and we're talking about climate. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. And with me today in the studios is Dr. Art Sussman. We're talking about climate and climate change and the factors and forces that uh, determine changing climates. We had a nice, uh, in our last segment, we had a nice sort of overview of the whole thing, the, the simple story. Now, at this time, we want to get a little, uh, want to sort of dig in a little deeper, and we have a, a graphic, uh, computer interactive that I think shows uh, some, of, some of the flows that are going to happen, and if our control room can get that up there, there it is, okay. So, Art? Okay, so as uh, we were talking about, the simple story is that uh, matter on our planet tends to stay here. It does stay here. We don't get new matter. The same matter just keeps going round and round. People are kind of familiar with the water cycle. 
We also have a carbon cycle and a nitrogen cycle. Uh, basically, for any form of matter, uh, it's going round and round on our planet, and we're trying to understand that. Uh, it turns out for climate, we really care about the carbon cycle, uh, which is important to us anyway. We're all carbon-based organisms here on planet Earth, uh, so carbon's important to us. Uh, and for climate, carbon is particularly important because carbon dioxide is a gas that's part of the carbon cycle, and that uh, is one of the most important gases in uh, regulating what Earth's global climate is, what the average temperatures of the air and ocean is on our planet. And uh, so we care about the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, and so uh, what we have here is a an illustration is something we developed with a public broadcasting station called WGBH that uh, explains about the carbon cycle. For any cycle of matter, what we care about is, okay, where is that stuff? For the water cycle, it's like, where's the water? Well, we know that the water, most of the water in the water cycle is in the ocean. Then there's also water that's evaporated in the air. It's always there. And there's also water that um, is underground you know, in our wells, uh, and there's water in lakes. Uh, so that's what we do with the water cycle is where is the water, and how does it move from one place to another? Uh, and so we have for the carbon cycle uh, the different places that it is. And we call these different places reservoirs. Reservoirs are in just water. Uh, and for the carbon cycle, we're going to look at uh, where it is on our planet and how much of it is in these different places. Uh, so this is this part of the interactive, which is under carbon cycle reservoirs. And the units we use are these GTs. Uh, so if you look in the atmosphere, it says 840 GT. Uh, and a GT is a billion tons. It's what we call a gigaton. It's a unit of measure. And if you were actually learning more about this interactive and using it, you would click on this I, and it would tell you more about it. It says most of the carbon in the air is carbon dioxide. Um, and the atmosphere is the reservoir of the, of the carbon cycle that changes the most. Um, and then, uh, so that's how much is uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, we also have a bunch in the ocean. The ocean has 41,000. Uh, so the ocean has a lot of it. The most of the carbon is actually in rocks. So down here it says 60 million gigatons. But the thing about the rocks is that the carbon that's in the rocks stays in the rocks. We know that rocks are very stable. Uh, so um, that doesn't particularly influence the carbon cycle over the course of hundreds of years. Uh, so we're not going to be concerned too much with that. The other big place where carbon is that we care about in terms of affecting the amount in the atmosphere is in organisms. And actually, most of the carbon is in organisms is in what we call land biomass, which is plant material and also soil. So that has 2,500 gigatons. And then there's carbon that's buried under the ground. And that's uh, the fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. And there's uh, 10,000 gigatons of that. So if we look at it, there's about a, you know 840 gigatons in the atmosphere. And there's a you know, bunch in uh, plants and soil. There's a whole lot more in the ocean. And that's moving back and forth with the atmosphere. And there's a whole bunch in fossil fuels that up until about 150 years ago stayed in fossil fuels. What was there stayed there and was buried underground. And uh, what we, the next part of understanding this uh, is to actually look at um, how this stuff moves. So like I said, when we look at a cycle of matter, like the carbon cycle or the water cycle, we care about where this stuff is and how it moves from one place to another. So carbon moves out of the ocean into the atmosphere. And it also moves, uh, carbon dioxide just dissolves in the ocean. Uh, so that's one. And these two are relatively balanced. You'll see when we look at the numbers a little later that they're not quite 100% balanced, but about the same amount goes into the ocean by dissolving as goes out by undissolving, escaping. And, uh, and the similar thing happens between the atmosphere carbon 
and uh, the plant biomass. Uh, so plants do photosynthesis, they make sugar, and in that process they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they make their bodies, they make sugar. And we animals eat their bodies, and then it, we breathe out that carbon dioxide when we burn the sugar, and plants also burn some of their sugar and it goes back out. And these two are pretty closely balanced. It's a little easier to look at that by uh, looking at a chart here, which shows that this is the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And over the course of a year, about 169 gigaton goes into the atmosphere, and 169 gigaton goes out of the atmosphere. This is the way things were 300 years ago, before industrialization kicked in. And so, and human activity, basically, we weren't taking carbon dioxide out, we weren't putting it in. So. Uh, for thousands of years, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been stable. And uh, the, I'm going to click now on the part where it says, well, what's going on today? And if we look at what's going on today, we have a different story. And the, the biggest change in the story is that today we're putting, so here's the human activity part. We're putting 10 gigatons, 10 billion tons of carbon a year into the atmosphere. And most of that is because we're burning fossil fuels. Anytime we burn something that has carbon in it, that carbon combines with oxygen. That's what burning is. And carbon combines with oxygen and makes CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, so we're putting nine gigatons of carbon per year in the form of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then there's also things we're doing where in case you haven't noticed it, we actually changed the natural world a lot. Uh, we're one of the dominant forces of nature now with the seven billion of us and all of our technologies. And the changes that we're making to the Earth's natural systems are putting another gigaton of carbon per year. Um, so let's go see, well, what's happening to the budget in the atmosphere? Well, it turns out uh, even though we're putting 10 gigatons per year, and that's feeding into this, um, five of those gigatons, half of that carbon that we're putting up into the atmosphere is actually being taken out of the atmosphere and stored uh, by the ocean and by plants. So plants have kicked in and done more photosynthesis. They're not really trying to help us. It's just they right. see extra CO2 in the air and they're able to grow a little bit more. So plants are doing that and then uh, just normal chemistry means if you're going to have more CO2 in the air, it's going to force more of it into the ocean. So the ocean has been absorbing more CO2 as well. So uh, we're pumping 10 gigatons per year through by, by our human activities. The oceans are, and the plant life and the soil are actually taking half of that extra stuff and keeping it out of the atmosphere. So the uh, atmosphere currently is increasing by five gigatons per year. Five and billion tons. Of five billion tons, tons of carbon, carbon per, per year, year are being added. Yeah. To so as actually, we're now at the state where the atmosphere is 40 percent more higher concentration of carbon dioxide than it is now. So, uh, you with 40 percent, there's quite a big change. Right. I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of us would like to earn 40% more sure, money than sure. we, we earn. Really or on, if or we, you know, our rent up went up 40%. That's, you know, uh, when we're balanced in our things and something changes by 40%, that's a pretty big change. Right. So this uh, is like geoengineering on a, on a large yeah, scale. Yeah, we're doing an experiment with our planet. Right. Uh, and we, it's not like we don't know. We don't know. We have ideas through science. We actually predict if we added 40% to the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is a heat-trapping gas, we would predict that our climate would get warmer. Right. And we actually have the science data going back, uh, our own records with thermometers a couple hundred years, and then we have things like tree rings and ice cores uh, that also give us a pretty good indication of what temperatures were like uh, going back thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. Right. And we can see that uh, we are causing global warming today. Yeah. 
even though we were only a small part of that large, those large numbers, right. that 10 gigatons was relatively yeah. modest compared to the 200 gigatons. Right. But still, that, that little half of yeah. a percent really pushes things. Right. Well, if you have a system where everything's kind of, stuff's going in, right. stuff's going out, but the same amount is going in and going out, and then you keep adding a little bit more that isn't going out, right. it's going to keep building yeah, up and building rapidly. up. Right. That's, yeah. that's a, a nice explanation. So, and the, uh, of course, there are other, other gases too, uh, methane that's a very powerful right. and it water turns vapor. Out, yeah, uh, water vapor itself is a greenhouse right. gas. Right. Um, and that's where we start saying the story can be more right. complicated, right. but we're going to try and keep with a simple story. And we actually know from our science records that carbon dioxide is a big part of the knob for a global climate. It's the biggest gas in our atmosphere in terms of changing and changing the amping up the global temperature. Uh -huh. And so uh, we can actually see that in this, um, if we go to this other part of this interactive, uh, this, this part, the blue line here, is actually showing what the concentration of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And it's been pretty steady at what we call 270 parts per million. Um, that's the science measure of it. So um, that's taking you back a thousand years. A thousand right? years. If right. we go back to the year 1000, that's what it was. Uh, and we know this from ice cores and other ways as well. And it's been pretty steady at that level. And then here uh, is where we kick in with burning fossil fuels. And so now we're getting up to 400. Uh, this was a number we really did not want to get to. A lot of us. Uh, there's a whole organization that said that built its name on 350.org. Right. They said, "Don't go over 350." Right. Well, guess what, folks? We're up at 400. Right. Um, and then if we actually look at what the global temperatures have been, which is going to be a red arrow showing up. So there's been some ups and down, ups and downs, ups and downs, and then whoopsie, yeah. we're now starting to get temperatures that are um, not anything that we've experienced in human history or at least civilized, right. quote, civilized human history. Um, so we have definite evidence of global warming, that, that it, uh, everything about this warming points to humans as the cause. It's not because the sun has been shining more. It's not because of volcanoes putting gas in the air. It's because humans have putting, been putting CO2 in the air. And that's pretty well-established science, uh, even though there may be attempts by others to try and sow doubt and confusion about that. Right, right. But it's, it's, it's quite evident from a, a variety of different streams of data that, right. that, that this there's is. Right. Actually, one of the, uh, there's actually a thing that uh, we, part of what we do is look at what are the signs that this warming is uh, because of the carbon dioxide in the air. And we can actually measure the heat escaping Earth and see the effect of the CO2. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then another prediction uh, is that the temperatures in the evening will have shown the more increase than the temperatures during the day. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I certainly m notice that when I'm uh, out more in the natural world away from the city uh -huh. and in places where I've been a lot in the days and evenings, different parts of the year, that the evenings are warmer. Right, so th this is then going to begin to get into the next part of our discussion, which we're going to have after the next break, which is on the, the impacts. So, so sort of big right. deal. Uh, you know, it's got more carbon dioxide, yeah, temperature's going up. But right. yeah, but when we come back, we're going to talk about like how is this impacting the planet? How is it impacting ecosystems? How is it impacting human systems? But that's all when we come back. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science, joined today by doc Dr. Art Sussman from WestEd, and we're talking about climate climate change and uh, the mechanisms for this. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Willow Chang Elion and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process and they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show, whether they live here or they live abroad. It's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping uh, it going. Okay. I'll go, I'll go a little quicker. Good afternoon. You're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, we're broadcasting from Think Tech Studios here in Pioneer Plaza. 
Today, uh, on Likeable Science, we're talking about climate and climate change. And uh, join me, joining me today is Dr. Art Sussman from West Ed. And we want, we've been exploring uh, now pretty deeply the mechanisms of climate change. And I want to talk a little bit now about the impacts of climate change. Right. And so uh, give, give us again the, sort of the overview. What, what, what are so right. the temperatures going up? You know, right. So we've increased the amount of heat trapping gases right. in the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide. And we're actually seeing the temperatures in the air and the ocean going up. Right. Uh, so we call that global warming. And that's, uh, but uh, global warming is uh, the more direct thing that's coming because of the carbon dioxide in the air, uh, but th that itself has repercussions. Right. And so people noticing, you may have noticed yourselves about uh, changes in when things flower or when uh, birds are migrating. Right. So we're changing the seasons. The right. seasons are coming sooner. Uh, we're changing uh, where organisms can live because organisms are moving to live uh, in places that are more like the temperature they're used to if they can. So we're seeing uh, organisms moving north or moving up mountains that weren't usually there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, actually if we could have the slide about uh, the flows of energy, that would be like a quick recap of the um, what's going on with our planet's energy. I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly. I said in the first part that basically the sun is the most important source of energy for our planet and that uh, that energy, which is the yellow light coming in, then is absorbed by the ground and the ocean, and that makes heat. So that's then we switch to red arrows to show the heat. Uh, there's a long vertical, ar horizontal arrow, which is how the heat moves around on our planet. But eventually that heat goes to outer space, and those are the red arrows going up. Uh, on its way to outer space, it's got to pass through the atmosphere. And as it passes through the atmosphere, the gases in the atmosphere absorb that heat, heat trapping greenhouse gases, and that's part of what keeps our planet comfortably warm. But now we're adding to that by burning fossil fuels, so we're having global warming. Um, and the heat stays longer on our planet. Uh, so we can have the next one. It kind of uh, summarizes that in a different way. The, uh, the, the climate graphics, uh, we already had some climate graphics that were uh, uh, yeah, go to the next. Uh, the the next one beyond. Right. There we go. Okay, so this one is summarizing <coughs> again. So you look at the top, we're talking about we burn fossil fuels. That burning of fossil fuel causes more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if you look at the arrow straight down, causes global warming, higher air and ocean temperatures. Well, those higher air and ocean temperatures cause sea level rise. They cause the ice that's on the land to melt, and they cause the ocean water to get warmer, and warmer ocean water actually expands in volume. Um, when we heat something up, it gets bigger uh, because the molecules are moving around more. So sea level rise is a big concern to islands. And then the other thing that that change in temperatures does is it changes rain patterns. So we might see more drought. We might see more precipitation some places, more drought other places. We might see ch changes in storms. And we're not, uh, and uh, so the patterns of the rain uh, are, are changing in uh, relatively unpredictable ways. And then there's also another phenomenon where the carbon dioxide that dissolves in the ocean actually is changing what we call the pH, the acid-base balance, and we have another climate change impact that we call ocean acidification. So we, we have these things going on uh, that are changes to our planet. And if we can see the next one, we'll see why we care about these things. Because they don't happen in isolation. They actually happen right here on our planet where the organisms live in ecosystems and they've become adapted to the way things are and have been for hundreds and thousands of years. And now we're changing things. And this thing. Uh, this graphic uses these uh, four icons, one for uh, rising sea levels, one for changing rain patterns, one for uh, changing the acid-base balance of the ocean, and one for the changing, make the warming of the temperatures of the air and the upper ocean. And each of those things uh, affects uh, something good that we get from ecosystems. And that's what the 
uh, downward columns are. Why do we care about ecosystems besides if we're really res res you know, feeling as stewards of the earth that we should care? And many of us do naturally care. We actually get uh, things that are of practical value. We get food from ecosystems. We get resources like wood. Um, we get income because we fish or we have tourism because our ecosystem is so beautiful that people want to experience it with us. Uh, so these are all values. And then there's important cultural and spiritual values of ecosystems. All of these are affected because ecosystems uh, that have gotten used to the way the organisms have gotten used to the conditions that have been here for hundreds and thousands of years now are changing. The sea levels are higher. Uh, the uh, temperatures are higher, the acid-base balance is different, and the rain patterns are changing. Uh, so that's uh, looking at it from the point of view of ecosystems. But we also, humans, our seven billion of us, uh, we live within human systems. We're not uh, uh, separate from nature and we're not separate from each other. So if we could look at the, the next graphic, uh, this is looking at human systems. Uh, and for the purposes of just talking about it, we talk about that human systems provide us with shelter. We build our homes, we build our roads, uh, transportation. Uh, we get fresh water, very important to us. Uh, we get our fresh water uh, from uh, the natural world and we organize how we distribute that fresh water and we get our food. And sea level rise affects all of these things that we get and depend upon uh, as human systems. Uh, think about where our airports are. Almost most of our airports are right by the ocean. Uh, so sea level rise could have a dramatic effect on our transportation. Um, and changes in rain patterns and sea level rise with the saltiness of the ocean intruding into our groundwater affects our freshwater supply. And the way that we get food, all the ways that we get food, uh, many of the ways that we get food are affected by each of these four different uh, climate change impacts on the natural world. The sea level rise, uh, the changing rain patterns, think about agriculture, uh, ocean acidification uh, is uh, something that will be very harmful uh, for coral reefs and uh, other shelled organisms, and the changing ocean temperatures and air temperatures. So we are uh, doing an experiment on our one and only planet, and uh, the planet, it's, there's easy things to understand about our planet, but a lot of stuff that we don't know. Mm. And uh, uh, there's a, a, a scientist who does this work, and he's fond of helping to try to understand the implications of that. And part of what he points out is it's a lot easier to mess something up than to build it up from scratch. Absolutely. Uh, so among the things that we don't know, it's more likely that if there's going to be surprises, they're not going to be pleasant surprises. Right. And there's actually a great example of that. So we have what looks like a pleasant surprise in that uh, in the previous section, we talked about how we're putting 10 gigatons, 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the air. And only five of those, half of that is staying in the air because the ocean is absorbing extra and uh, plant life is absorbing extra. Well, it turns out, well, it's not such a great thing. So that, that's a pleasant surprise in terms of the global warming that's right. happening. Right. Uh, but it turns out that the extra carbon dioxide that the ocean's absorbing is changing the acid-base balance right. of the ocean. So that's an unpleasant thing to be happening. Right. And we, have, we see th these things around us right now. I mean, we, we, we are seeing, for instance, the oceans around Hawaii have been quite a bit warmer uh, yeah. in, in recent months then historically they, they really should be. Right. Uh, the corals are bleaching uh, to, according to some of the experts, an unprecedented extent. Right. Um, and at the same time, we're now uh, facing uh, what our third hurricane for this year. And, and right. Hawaii's typically not gotten hurricanes. It's right. been, so its waters have been a little, a little bit too cool for the hurricanes. Right. They stay fueled up if they get here. And yes, this is all changing now and, and in, in very, uh, as you say, un un unpleasant ways sometimes, you know, uh, the surprises yeah. are not... Uh, yeah, so coral reefs are a great example. Right. And uh, as I talk with people who work and study coral reefs, 
actually the climate scientists are pretty disturbed in terms of their projections of the extent of damage to coral reefs over the next 50 to 100 years right. and what will remain for us. Right. Uh, coral reefs, uh, kind of uh, the nice thing about the tropics is that temperatures are pretty stable. They don't change much day to day. They don't change much year to year. Well, the natural ecosystems have gotten used to that. So they're not built to tolerate changes in temperature so much. And so as the tropics warm even more, then uh, a lot of the organisms here have not adapted over thousands of years to be ready for right. those kind of changes. And corals are particularly sensitive. Right. So that's where we see coral bleaching, where they're actually, uh, uh, the bleaching is they're throwing out organisms that help them right. get food. Exactly. And uh, if coral bleaching goes on long enough and happens often enough, the coral reef dies. Right. And coral reefs are very important for fisheries and tourism, uh, food security, and uh, we may not see coral reefs anywhere near the extent that we have them now in 50 to 100 years. Exactly. One of my uh, past guests on the show, uh, Dr. Mary Hagedorn, works on, on Coconut Island and studies coral, actually cryopreserves cor coral egg, sperm, and embryos right. uh, <coughs> in a sort of desperate race to uh, keep the be sure that we have corals when, when and if we manage to get the oceans back into a habitable mm -hmm. condition for them. Right. It will be uh, an interesting, an interesting race. So there's certainly, uh, yeah, huge, uh, huge impacts. And uh, we know in, in other tropical islands that the, the issues of the mangroves, right? Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of issues everywhere. I see we have about two minutes left, and I guess I would say one of the things that we need to be thinking about is we often hear that. So what should we do about this? Mm -hmm. And on an individual level, we're exhorted to bike, ride our bikes or uh, turn off our cell phone chargers and things like that. I think one thing people need to do is consider how much is actually being caused by each of these different things. We have a tendency to go, okay, I've been unplugging my cell phone charger and riding my bike, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not really affecting it. And then not think very much about things we do that have large impacts, like driving a lot in cars that... Um, have uh, low mileage, or uh, especially flying. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out among the other things that eating meat is a big uh, uh, results in a lot of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, but more importantly, I think, is not just what we do individually, but how we're part of organizations and institutions and um, cities and towns and states and countries and what we do at that level and what can we can do to affect what's done at that level is uh, very important because the scale of the problem is huge. Right. What we do individually matters. What we do at larger and larger and larger levels of our existence uh, really matters. Right. Well, it matters pro probably even more. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so that's no excuse not to do what we can do individually, but we should also be working to get be sure our organizations uh, on, on every level are uh, doing what they can do too, and, yes. and having having the positive influences. So this is uh, this is this is great stuff. Art. I, I uh, this is an intriguing conversation here, and I'm sorry that, that it's unfortunately going to have to come to an end uh, because we are, are, as you observed, running out of time. But uh, it, it's been great uh, to to get a, a good deep look at. at climate change, see the mechanisms that, that control it, that underlie it, and uh, I very much appreciate your coming here and, and sharing, sharing your uh, knowledge with us. Thank you for offering me this opportunity. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen. I've been, Dr. Art Sussman has been with me today on Likeable Science, and we'll see you next week.